So yeah, let's, we good with going into the Word this morning? We want to get in the Word, right? Every week we like to get into the Word of God and kind of dig through and find some truth. Uh, something that we maybe didn't know before. And so we've been talking this sermon series better than you think, and we've been walking through um, the Sermon on the Mount, one of the greatest sections of Scripture in the entire Bible, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. I hope you've been reading that often. Um, if you haven't been, uh, you know, I pray that you would pick up your Bible this week and read through it several times. This is life-changing stuff if we could get this just into our spirits. And um, yeah, I was thinking this week about, you ever, you ever get in an argument with people about the Bible and they, they don't really believe in God, but they're, they're self-made Bible scholars and they, they like to quote all kinds of crazy scriptures to you? Um, you ever have that experience? Yeah, me too. I was trying to think this week, you know, what's an atheist favorite Bible verses, like the ones they like to throw in my face all the time. And it's normally things like this. They love to take things out of context, verses that they pretend um, mean something that they don't really mean. And so they take things like, wives, submit to your husbands. They love that one, right? Christianity holding down women for the last 2,000 years. When really, if you look in, in history, in all of history, Women had basically no rights whatsoever, were not treated equally whatsoever until Christianity began, until compassion and love took over. And the whole women's rights movement, they have hijacked it from the church, but respect of women and those things um, is, is due to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But they love to bring that up. Because, I mean, all of you in here, you feel really oppressed, right? All the women in here feel oppressed this morning by the church? Yeah, Linda, you do. I see. I see that hand. I see that hand. Um, they love this one, too. Ephesians 6, 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. And they say, oh, look, the church for slavery. How about that? How about that? They don't read the rest, right? They just take it out of context. They don't, they're not bothered by the fact that you know, slavery was a, just a part of the culture at that time and that if a slave got saved, wouldn't it be in his best interest that his master got saved at some point? And so he said, work hard. Show them the gospel through your work. Show them the gospel through, through who you've been changed into. But the atheists, they don't, they don't care about that. I shouldn't even say atheists. I, it, I don't really believe in atheists. Um, uh, I, don't, I think everyone knows that there's a God. I think atheists are just mostly in denial um, about what they already know. But uh, I'm not going to go into all that this morning. They love these verses too. Atheists love to take the verses of judgment in the Old Testament and paint God as cruel and unjust. Um, they take something like this from Psalm 137. They say, Happy shall he be that takes and dashes your little ones against the stones. And um, sounds like not a great verse, right? I mean, who would be happy that they were dashing children against the stones? Um, Not great. Not great. And I can justify that. I can can go into it and say this was a nation that had torn apart God's chosen people. And that's what it's about. A nation that had been part of taking Jerusalem into captivity. And so... It's not even God that says that. It's the psalmist that says that. And if you had seen your family killed, uh, my guess is that some of you would have a little bit of anger there and you would be excited for the day when God would take retribution for your family. And I can justify it that way, um, but I can also look at it and say this. um, How many people, how many babies do you think God killed in the flood? Yeah, we don't like to think about that. We don't like to think that our God is sometimes, uh, I'm going to use this word, this is a Paul Washer word, as terrible as he is wonderful. And I'm not saying terrible in the way that we use terrible, that God is bad in some way, but that God is terrifying in his power and his judgment and 
how he is just. Have I depressed you adequately this morning? Are we there? Then, after you've gotten into this argument and you've justified all the verses and you begin to point out the hypocrisy of an atheist using the Bible and twisting scripture to come against me, if I point that hypocrisy out, I get this verse. This is, I think this is their favorite verse of all the verses right here. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, will be measured to you. How many times have you heard that? I mean, so many. So many. I hear it online more than I do in person, because people are much more brave online. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But they love that verse. Oh, judge not. Don't. You can't judge me. Jesus, Jesus said it. I think a lot of times our reaction is like, oh, well, yeah, I guess Jesus did say that, so I better, I better stop. And so my big question this morning is this. When is it okay for us to judge? When's it okay? It's rhetorical for now. You don't have to answer, but I've um, been struggling you know, with that a little bit. And we'll kind of walk through when I think it's okay to judge. And at that point, you might say, well, that's not judging anyway. And we can argue about terms and all that kind of stuff. But bear with me this morning. Be with me this morning. This is the next verse that we have. My wife, I instructed her to bring a log, and she brought me a (laughs) two-by-four. So you're going to have to pretend this morning. We just had a tree literally cut down in our yard. The yard is full of logs. And she went into the garage and got me a two-by-four. Praise the Lord. I love my wife so much. (laughs) When you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And it's literally, this is the picture that Jesus is pointing. I have this. Your says plank. Oh, praise the Lord. Okay, this is a plank. We're changing it this morning. This is literally what Jesus is talking about. I have this off my face. And I go, Mandy, you look so ridiculous this morning. Like, they're still asleep in your eyes. Did you even bother? Like, get that out of there. Come on. And th- that's how ridiculous it is. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. And we... We tend to think that he was very serious all the time, but he could use sarcasm really, really well. And so this is one of those instances. He's being very sarcastic, and he's saying, how could you possibly judge people for that? And we know that he's talking mostly to the Pharisees in the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to the religious rulers, and they would, they would go to the disciples and say things like, you, I can't believe you don't wash your hands before you eat. I can't believe you don't do that. And then Jesus would come back with something like, um, well, you don't wash out your insides. (laughs) You're evil and wicked from the core. And you're complaining that someone doesn't wash their hands? How could you do that? How could you judge in that way? And it's this, this is literally it. He's pointing out how, how hypocritical it would be for me to say, Joey, you got something on your face there. You got to clean that up. I mean, seriously. And we can be that way, can't we? I mean, there are times when I can point things out to people and, uh, and then later be convicted about that very same thing. And so God help us. God help us when we get to that place. So this is what I'm thinking. When's it not okay to judge? I got four different things here. And then I have their opposites. We'll just kind of walk through them one by one one here. It's not okay to judge others to justify yourself. Like if I'm trying to to justify uh, my own sinful life, and so I'm just going to be very righteous today, and I'm going to go point out all the sin of the world. Uh, Yeah, not great. That's kind of what we're talking about here, right? To make yourself judge. Because we'd rather be judged, right? 
because we're so much more loving and fair than God. Uh, so we would like to be judge over this world every week, children, every week. <laughs> when we're motivated by things like anger or jealousy or resentment or fear, because a lot of times we can get into that mode and we can look at things that are happening with the LBGT, is that, is that the right community in the United States? And we can look at those things and think, wow, um, how terrible that our country would approve of something like that. And so we can be fearful of that, those things that are coming or we can be angry about it and we can begin to, to lay down the law and bring the hammer down on those people and, and give them the, the scripture and all those kinds of things and, and we can do it from a spirit of anger and from a spirit of fear. And I can tell you that when you're in that place, it's not okay to judge at that moment. Lastly, it's not okay to judge when you're judging from a place where you lack self-awareness. And that's what this is, right? I mean, if I, if I lack self-awareness so much that I cannot see the log in my own eye, but I'm rather focused on, on the speck, the moat in someone else's, there's a big problem there. And it's not okay to judge. It's not okay to judge from that point. Here's where it's okay to judge. To justify God. To justify God. And a lot of you might say, well, God doesn't really need justification, uh, does he? I'd say, well, uh, maybe not. Maybe not. But to our world that doesn't really understand what's going on. You know, if I, if I look at those scriptures in the Old Testament and, the, and all the innocents that were killed in judgments of God, and I'm talking innocence of babies and, and those kinds of things, not sinful people, because they deserve judgment. But I can look at, at, at something like that, and I can, I can justify God in that point, and I can point people and say, look, we don't sin against some finite being, someone who is not worthy of our worship, someone who is not perfect and holy and all of those things. Wow. We sin against the God Almighty, the perfect one, the one who is absolute perfection in every way. And so when you sin against someone like that, it's worthy of punishment. It's worthy of everlasting punishment. And so if I can justify God in that way, if I can make people see that, okay, this truly is what should happen to you. And the only reason that it hasn't is because of God's grace and His mercy in waiting for you to come to Him. Um, I'm not justifying God in the grand sense because God needs no justification. But I can justify Him to people and try to change their worldview just a little bit. Or at least change how they look at the Scriptures. Does that make sense? Okay. Instead of making myself judge, I do it to introduce people to the judge. So I'm not high and mighty above all things, but I can, I can take you into the courtroom. I can take you into the courtroom of God and, and we can stand before Him together and He can point out who you really are. I don't have to do that. I can actually use the Scripture in a loving way and just ask probing questions, you know. Ever been angry with somebody? Ever been lustful towards anybody? And if the answer is yes, then judgment is totally justified. That's what the word says. The wages of sin is death. Absolutely. Instead of being motivated by anger, jealousy, resentment, or fear, it's okay if you're motivated by love. If you really want to see that person come to salvation and see that person come to be changed and come to be glorified, then, it, then it's okay to have that conversation. It's okay to go there. Um, keep it at love. Keep it at love. Um, my greatest fear is that if we had, say, a, 
say we could get somehow a forum with the gay community in Katanning. My fear is that for many of us that we could go to them and we could preach to them and we would be uh, okay with them changing, but we wouldn't want them to come to our church. And I hope that's not the case. And I don't think that it is here. But I think a lot of churches in Katanning, they would be okay with preaching to them. They would be okay with laying down the law and showing them all the scriptures that show all the things that are wrong to them. They would not be okay with them entering the doors of their church. We're not that. We're not that church, right? This is a place we're all growing together. And as long as you come in here honestly seeking the truth, honestly seeking the Lord, you're welcome here. You're welcome here. It doesn't mean we're going to condone your sin any more than I'm going to condone Donovan's anger problem or whoever else's whatever. And Donovan doesn't really have an anger problem. I'm just pointing out something. (laughs) Didn't want to point that out in front of everybody, but here. He's working on it. Praise the Lord. Lastly, it's okay to judge if you come from a perspective that you know what you are. You're not lacking self-awareness. You're not, you're not ignorant of the log in your own eye. If you've come before the Lord and you, you come with a humble heart and you know what you are, you know all the sins in your life, you know the place that you came from, you know that you're not better than anybody else. If you come at it from that perspective, then it's okay to have that conversation. Because you can say that openly then, right? I can go to someone and say, look, there's no sins that are special here. I'm not coming against you because I think that your sin is somehow worse than my sin. I'm coming to you because I know that there's a Savior who can wash away all sin, and he can wash away yours like he washed away mine. And he can change you like he changed me. Amen? So what's this look like in the real world? I kind of gave you a couple different examples here. Um, I went went ahead just a little too fast, but that's okay. So in the church, it can look look different than it does with unbelievers, okay? In the church, I always think of 1 John when I think of something like this. The book of 1 John is like one big test to see, are you really in the truth? Do you really know God? Are you really his child? And so he goes through all these different scriptures, and and John, of all the apostles, John was known as the loving one. So if we're going to learn how to do this right from a perspective of love, I think, I mean, Jesus obviously is our first example. Um, John would be the one, I think, how to do this in a loving way. And uh, Paul was certainly, he was known for how smart and cerebral he was, and you look at some of the things Paul wrote, and just, what a brilliant man. And you look at Peter and how just brash and forward he was, and he would probably not be the one that we would want to learn from on how to uh, coax people <laughs> into the kingdom. But John, the loving John, he's worth, he's, he's worth learning from here. First uh, John 1, 6, and 7 says this, If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And so John there is saying to believers, you know, he's talking to a church where it's been split, and now there's been some believers who left the original church, and they they went off into a new church. There was some new knowledge, some higher knowledge, and some of the believers left, and they said, oh, you know, we have the real stuff over here. You know, there's more than just Jesus. And so come over here and figure out what we're doing. And John points out to them, no, that the light, the light is where Jesus is at. He said, if you live a style of life where you're walking in the darkness more than you're walking in the light, you probably don't have fellowship with Jesus. You're probably not his child. You're probably not saved. And so you need to get in the light. You need to walk in the light. And I love, I mean, he just says it in a loving way. And if you read First John, he's always talking, he says, Dear children, dear children, little children. 
And he's just like, you could just feel the love just flowing out of him. But he says some hard things. He says, verses 8 through 10, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There's self-awareness again. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. He says, if you run around saying that you're perfect, believer, supposed believer, you run around haughty, thinking that you're perfect, better than everyone else? No. It would, it would, it would, if you say that, you're calling Jesus Christ a liar. You're calling Jesus a liar. And his word has no place in your lives. Because we only came to him because we weren't perfect, right? If we were perfect, we wouldn't even need Jesus. We would just write, write to heaven. He would just go right up. No problem. You know? People always say that there's one way to heaven, right? And that's not true. There's actually two ways to heaven. Did you know that? Did you know there's two ways to heaven? Yeah, two ways. There's some, well, you're learning something new this morning. You guys are going to learn something new. Well, some of you are thinking, well, I'm going to leave this church. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> two ways to heaven. You can either go through Jesus or you can be absolutely perfect. You can never sin and you can go right, you can go right through. So which one would you like to choose this morning? Through Jesus, right? Because there's no perfect people in here. None. You guys are all sinful people. That's why we love Jesus so much. And the more that we get, learn to know about ourselves, the more that we get to know ourselves, the more self-awareness that I have, the more that I love Jesus because I realize all the things that he's forgiven me of, all the ways that he's changed me over the last seven, eight years, all the things, all the darkness that he's brought out and replaced with this light. Wow, he is amazing. I'll just do one more from John. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if someone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. And we've we, we, you know, seen this in, in places. We see people come in, sometimes flash in the pan. You know, see someone come to church just one time, and they don't even really allow us to get to know them, but we come in and they're just like, just in worship, they're just dancing and praising hands and doing all that stuff. And I love that. I love when people worship that way. But there's a lot of people that say, oh, I know him. And proclaim him in worship. But when you begin to point out things in their life, you begin to say, hey, there's some scripture here that actually requires some obedience. They're gone. They're gone. They may not know the Lord. And I'm not that judge. I don't, I don't proclaim anyone in heaven or in hell. I'd just like to introduce you to the judge. So that's with believers. With unbelievers, it would be a little bit different. Jesus gives this advice. He says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and they turn to attack you. And might I suggest that you don't use that verse when you, when you point this out to somebody? Uh, <laughs> but you can think it in your mind, okay? There's, there comes a point in an argument with someone where it's just not worth it. Where it's just not worth it anymore. And if you've said your piece, if, if you've begun to justify every verse that they bring up, every, everything that they try to call you crazy about, and you begin to pull out all the information that you've gathered over the years, all the historical proofs of Jesus and all the different articles and all the different you know, proving of uh, you know, hieroglyphics in Egypt that prove that the flood was really happened and all the, you point out, pull out all that stuff, it's probably not worth it. You can use those pearls for other people. Don't, <laughs> don't give to the dogs what is holy. Don't throw the pearls that God has given you before the pigs. They'll just use it against you. They'll just because they're coming from a whole different worldview. 
they're already reading this Bible from, from a point of view that, that is completely different than ours. And so all we really have to do with them is make sure they get the gospel. Make sure we introduce them to the judge. Make sure that they know where they're at at the end of the day. And, and leave, leave well enough alone after that. You have to pull out all your biblical knowledge because it's not going to help until they meet Jesus. Be, be discerning in the spirit. There's some people that I can go on with more because they only like to poke and prod and, and they're not doing it viciously. They just like to have fun with it. And so I'm, I'm game for that because I like to argue anyway. So that's like my thing. So I'll do that all day long. But I'm just saying you don't have to lose any sleep over it. You give them the gospel. Don't allow yourself to get angry or frustrated or get into that other place of judgment that's not okay. Stay, stay where Jesus is. Stay where, stay where John is from a place of love. Amen? You with me? Sorry, I'm not like up today. I hope you're okay with that. Here's some scripture. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. And I just think so many times we look at God as if he is this vicious judge. As if he is just waiting to bring the hammer down on us. As if, uh, we talked a little bit about this on Thursday. As if he plays favorites. As if he answers some people, but others of his children are not quite as good. And so I'm not quite as good, and I have such a low opinion of myself that God would never answer my prayers. And so why would I even ask? Don't do that. Little children, don't do that. Ask your father. He really is that good. He really is good. When he says this, he means it. When we ask, and we could apply that kind of same test, right? When we're asking from a place of love, when we're asking not to justify ourselves, but to glorify the kingdom, when we're asking with right motivations. We know that it's not like, oh God, I would like a Ferrari in front of my house. And then it's there, because the scripture says that. No, that's not it. Although I do have some stories. It's, that's, that's not all crazy. Um, that's for another day, though. But ask him. Ask him for the things that you need. Ask him for the things that you can use for the kingdom. And he will provide it. I've seen it so many times that he just, he just provides it again and again and again. And there's so many stories from this church. The chairs that you're sitting on. Do you guys remember that story? I mean, we were going we to bring over these old chairs that we had. We were, I, w- I was getting ready to hit send to purchase sound equipment. And I got a call from Pastor Kent in Greenville and said, hey, there's a church closing in Cincinnati. They have all this sound equipment and these, these, these new chairs, and they just wanted to know what you want. And I said, uh, everything. <laughs> it was like, we needed it. We had the money for it. We've been praying for it. And then God just gave it to us. And we had the money to do other stuff. How awesome. How great is that? So, oh, we need some computers. We need some computers. And Kayla says, oh, my dad, he, uh, he has all these old computers that his work does, and they're like brand new, and he just reformats them, and then they, they just get rid of them. They junk them, or they give them away. And so, free computers. And we needed computers. Computers are necessary for what we do here. Praise God. He just provides it. I have so many stories from myself. My mom, she listens to all these sermons, and I can remember when I was a little kid, <laughs> And my mom would be out too late one night uh, doing things that she wasn't supposed to do that she doesn't do anymore, okay? Uh, my mom has been a work in progress too. And she's going to listen to this. So you shouldn't tell stories on your mom, but <laughs> I'm going to anyway. Uh, I can remember she's always been a heavy sleeper and a late sleeper. She likes to sleep in. It's just how God made her. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I can remember as a kid, I wake up in the morning and I can remember wanting to go to a friend's house or wanting to just take the dog out for a walk. But if I would do that without permission, um, I'd be in big trouble, you know. So, but my mom's asleep. And so 
I can remember sitting outside her door and just kind of like counting the minutes and being so scared to ask the question. Just ask, hey, Mom. 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 And get louder and louder until she finally wake up. She go, what? What do you want? Like, can I go to my friend's house? I say, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And so, but I can remember just being so afraid of her reaction. Being so afraid of how she would, how she would be. Because she liked to sleep in. And if I'm waking her up and her sleeping in time, that was not, that was not good. <laughs> and I thought that way, even though my mom was a really good mom. I mean, she loved me. She was never abusive to me. There was never any of that kind of stuff. I mean, especially you consider my circumstances growing up, the situation that she was in. My mom was a great mom. And I can remember even in that place, just being so afraid to ask for a simple request. My fear is that some of you are that way with God. That some of you are just so tentative in your prayer, just, just fearing how he might react to your request. That you're just standing outside the gates of heaven, like knocking real light so you don't wake him up, so you don't bug him. God, God, can I ask one small thing? And I've heard some of you pray like this. Oh, God, I know you're really busy, and I know there's lots of things going on, but would you please hear my prayer? You don't have to pray like that. God is not too busy. He has no capacity. There's no limit to the things that he can hear, to the things that he can answer, to the things that he could do. If you're his child, you can go boldly in. You do not have to be afraid of the reaction that you get. He will give you either a yes or a no or a not yet. And he will love you the whole way through. So ask, children. Ask. Was I the only one that ever did that to their mom? No? Okay, some of you did. Look at this. Of which one of you, if his son asked him for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, will give him a serpent? If, he, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Isn't that awesome? Isn't that great? And this is, this is a whole new meaning to me because my wife is very, she's much more strict at snack time than dad is, okay? And Joanna, she's pretty smart and she's hungry. That girl is hungry <laughs> all the time. She wants, she wants to eat, just like her daddy. She wants a snack right now. <laughs> so I'll ask, Joanna, what do you want for snack time? She always says, chocolate. <laughs> chocolate. Okay, and mom would always say, no, you can't have chocolate before dinner. And dad will say, just two M&Ms and that's it. <laughs> and say, what else do you want? Oh, and we'll open the fridge. I want an orange, an apple, and I want ammo crackers, and I want Ritz crackers, and I want Cheez-Its, and I want all the stuff. And she wants everything. <laughs> and you know what dad does? We get a little bit of everything. Because <laughs> I love that girl, and I love eating snacks. Let's have some snacks. Let's do this thing. I love them so much. I love my little girls so much. Sometimes I watch them outside and they play with each other and I can see that I'm like starting to pretend and starting to do different things. And I know that that time is so short. I know that it's not going to last and I just feel sometimes like my heart's going to explode. I love them so much. If you've had children, you know that experience. You know what it's like to see them grow and see them achieve little things and those little victories. And it's such a small thing, but in your house, it's like, it's big stuff. Like going on the potty for the first time, that should not be a big deal, but that's a big deal. <laughs> we celebrated. We danced in the house for an hour, I think, after the first time Abby went to the potty. It's big stuff. 
I'm evil, you guys. I'm evil, and I have the capacity to love like that. How much more do you think God loves you? Do you think he will deny any valid request for you? He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Whatever dark place you're in, whatever situation you're going through, you can know that He loves you and you can ask Him for help even in that place. Even in that place where you've turned away from Him and you've walked away from Him down, the, down a dark alley, out of light and into darkness, you can know that when you're in that place, you can still turn around and ask Him to bring you out. And He will. He will. This was not a crying sermon for me, but here we are. These are some things. If you're at the point where you're throwing pearls before pigs, you can leave them with this. God is always good. Even in the judgment times that we talked about, oh, we'll talk about that in a second. He, all, every decision that he makes Everything that he does, he has our best interests at heart. Even sometimes you go through painful things. You go through things that you don't really want to be a part of. And I've given you a lot of you this advice in the past. You say to me, oh, I'm in this dark place. And I feel like God is just hammering me. I feel like God is just, just really coming after me right now. And I think a lot of people would give you the advice, oh, you're a good person. You don't have to let that stuff get you down. I don't give that advice. I say, that's really great. Press into it. Let him work on you. I'm not going to get between the hammer and the work. I'm not going to do that to myself. I'm not going to do that to you. Press in. It's good when you press in. Amen? God is always good. He always has our best interests at heart. This is the second one. God is always just. Every judgment that he makes, you don't have to worry about like the O.J. Simpson trial or Casey Anthony trial where you get a judge that, that makes a bad decision. You don't have to worry about that with God. Every judgment that he makes is completely fair and completely accurate and he will never do something that is not fair. Like what I firmly believe, all the innocents that were killed in the flood were, are, are, <laughs> are with God. They're with God. And even if they're not, I have full confidence that God made the right decision. Because he is just every single time. He has never made a bad judgment. Ever. So you do not have to be concerned about whether the indigenous peoples that have never heard the name of Jesus. You do have to be concerned that they never heard the name of Jesus. You don't need to be concerned about the ones that have died in ages past because God will make the right decision. That doesn't have to keep you up at night. It should still keep you up at night that not everyone has heard the name of Jesus, that the mission is not done yet, that we still have more people to preach to, those kinds of things. But just know that God is fair, completely fair. Lastly, God is always the same. He's actually the only one that I can ever use the word correctly when I say always and when I say never. Because I could say, you know, Paul is always half an hour, hour early for church most of the time. I can say, Paul is always early for church. Always. And there will be a day where he will not be. He will not be consistent. He will not uh, achieve his normal standard and that's okay. I can't use that word for anyone else. I can't use always because you and I, we change all the time based on our mood and our emotions and all the different things that happen in life. We change constantly. But God does not change. Yesterday, today, and forever, he is the same. And that's a good thing. When you, when you, when you get that relationship with him and you understand that he's never going to change, that he's always going to be there, 
If you could really get that in your spirit, it changes your life forever. It changes you forever. On this, on this thing about asking, is there any of you that like need to get out of a thing that you're in? Like you need to get out of a place that you're, that you're in. You, you've wandered into darkness at some point and, and you just need to get back into the light but you're scared of what God would do. You're scared of the judgment, what would happen. Is anyone here that just wants to ask God for something this morning? To get out of darkness? Maybe you don't know him. Maybe you just want to ask this morning for salvation. Maybe you just want to ask for the next step, whatever it may be. Is there anyone who just wants to do that this morning? Yeah? A couple? Anyone else? Yeah? Okay. Anyone else? Yeah? Praise the Lord. Um, Do you guys want to come up and I can just pray with you? I'd like to do that. You want to come up? Is there anyone else? Okay. All right. Well, first I'll just pray for everyone, and then I'll pray with you guys specifically. So, Father, just pray that you would make us little children, that you would help us not to judge the world on your behalf, but to introduce the world to the judge, that you would help us to do things in a loving way and not in a way through fear or through our own resentment, or all the different ways that we can judge wrongly. God, help us to judge like Jesus judged. Help us to judge like John judged. And Maybe a better word is reprove or rebuke or whatever you would have us use, but God, help us just be more like you. And help us be like little children and just ask. Just ask for what we need. Ask for even what we want. Ask for all the things that could make us Move closer to you. Ask for all the things that will help us to build your kingdom. Ask for new vision. Ask for a word. Ask for a prayer for somebody. God, just help us to just ask. We just want to be like little children. We just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. The rest of you.